Hey, friends. Thank you so much. I hope that you're still enjoying the little few of an hour there. Uh, we're going to spend about five minutes. So if you folks want to sit down and grab a seat, enjoy the wine. We'll start very soon. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, we'll wait till 6 15. Uh, and then we'll do about five more minutes. So I think a couple more questions. Yeah. Thank you, Darren. I appreciate it. All right. Hi, folks. Are you here for that job screen? Go Thank you. I'm not in a rush. I'm just hanging out here so I don't have to run up here no, of course. Thank when you. we start.
I think we're ready. Ready? Yeah. Okay, That's great. Sure. Awesome. All right. Hi, everyone. We're just going to get started. Um, I am Caroline. I'm the Educational Programs Manager here at Center for Book Arts. I'm really delighted to welcome you here for this event. Um, before we get started, um, just a quick intro about Center for Book Arts. So we are an organization that works to support book artists through exhibitions, educations, public programs like this one, um, workshops, um, studio rentals, outreach programs. Um, so there's a lot we do here, and I would love to talk to you more about what we do. So if you're curious about um, Center for Book Arts or getting involved, feel free to just talk to me after the program. Um, but we're so delighted to present this film screening and discussion. Um, thank you so much for attending tonight. Um, just to note that this will be live streamed via YouTube, so you'll be able to watch it afterwards, share it with your friends, um, you know, spread the word. We definitely want people to get involved. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Carlos and you can get started. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Let me scoot over here, triple over these cables. <laughs> Thank you everyone for being here tonight. Very much. I hope that you, uh, have tried a little bit of the, the empanadas went super fast. I'm sorry for the late covers. There's still some wine over there for you guys through the event. Uh, it means a lot to me that you folks are here today. Thank you to the Center for Book Arts for giving us this space to be able to share a little bit of the, you know, this story and especially the photo book project. My name is Carlos Beltran. I am the director of both the short documentary and the photo book project we'll be viewing tonight. Today, I'm joined by my dear friend and talented book designer, Faride Mereb, who designed the book that we've titled, It Suddenly Occurred to Me. And we're also joined by a friend, writer, and uh, journalist, Ruben Machaen, who will be moderating the conversation between Faride Mereb and I later on in the evening. There's a lot that we try to pack in into a relatively very short evening, so I'll jump right in. It took me and a uh, small team of people about 12 years to put this little book uh, together. Uh, <laughs> the book is honestly uh, essentially what I would call a conversation between my photojournalism work in Caracas, Venezuela from 2009 to 2014 um, and Yadira Silva's text. Now Yadira Silva is an extremely complex character. She's a strong, talented woman who wrote most of the texts that appear in the book more than 30 years ago from inside some of the worst prisons in Venezuela. This journey started some 11, 12 years ago when I was in Caracas working on a documentary on the precarious prison system in that country. In that documentary, I featured the life of three former convicts, how they coped with the mistakes they made as young individuals, and ultimately how they try to seek redemption through their work, through their lives, in the case of Yadira Silva, through her writing. So in the documentary, I got just a glimpse of Yadira Silva's writing. Uh, so I figured that the best way to kind of get a sense of the value and importance of this book is just to start with a screening from the 2012 uh, short documentary, Voluntad y Paz, where um, once again, um, I show a little bit of the life of Yadira Silva. So uh, we'll begin with that. Um, little disclaimer. There is some strong language in the documentary and some images and anecdotes that some of you folks may or may not find a little upsetting. Um, all right. All right, let me, let's start from the beginning. Oh, and yeah, if we can turn off the lights, please here, I'll, I'll, uh, no. And thank you again for being here. Uh, the documentary is about 23 minutes long. And immediately after the documentary, we'll jump into the conversation between Farida and I on uh, the book that we put together. All right, thank you so much.
si es tu esposa, si es un novio de tu hija, si es un novio de tu mamá, si es un novio de tu hija, y yo te conozco a ti. Quiero que vaya a buscar todo lo que le pidió de la señora. Yo solo busco la envidia, fue a buscar todas sus cosas, y después le trajo la cosa a la señora, le dije, bueno, mira, la rodilla sobre la señora y pide el perdón. Y él se arrodilló y decía, uy, no vayas a matar, no vayas a matar. Después que le pidió perdón a la señora y a los muchachos, tienen que decir lo que ustedes saben que tienen que hacer. Si el hipoteco técnica de la CIRSA, el hipoteco del centro comercial, no parecían dos y tres y cuatro muertos como bien se han hecho el hipoteco, porque yo lo mandé a los tiranos de los hipotecos técnicos para no tirar a los tiranos de la calle. Y van a ir luego. La cuestión era que nos enfrentaran. Pero nosotros y lo que darle 14 machetazos. Sin yo recibir a Dios gracias, ni uno. Tenía muchos enemigos, yo estaba enculebrado con Pan y Mango y la Tichica, los super amigos, todo lo que era luchar por la justicia era mi enemigo. Si salían las tortugas niñas por una cantarilla y iban a llevar a ti. Como pequeñito era tremendísimo, era inquieto, era bueno, era malo. Eso era todo lo que me llamaba la maestra para que la dame que era de la hija, la me daba que era Yo veía aquellos niños de la marina. Vestido con todo así de blanco, y yo decía, abuela, yo lloraba, y yo decía, abuela, yo quiero estar ahí, yo quiero estar ahí, yo quiero estar ahí, mi abuela me decía, claro, mi hijo, usted va a estar ahí, sigue estudiando, porque esta persona llega muy bien, y yo decía, abuela, yo quiero, yo quiero, pero yo no quiero que te vayas a morir, si tú te me mueres, te iba a hacer una presión, le dije, eh, ya mi madre era al lado, pero mi anhelo y mis ojos era mi abuela, pues. Y bueno, cuando tuve la edad de 14 años, 13 años, mi abuela falleció. Y bueno, mi vida se derrumbó, se vino abajo y mi mamá me llevó con ella, yo me fui con ella y yo tenía ya la edad de 13 años y medio, ¿no? yo con los 14. Entonces me querían encerrar en el último cuarto y me querían apoyar, no me querían dejar salir para la calle y me decían que por qué, si no era un delincuente, que por qué si no era un asesino. Porque si yo no consumía droga, ¿por, ¿por qué mi hermana tenía a mí castigado, o sea, madre encerrado en un cuarto? Bueno, mi hermano de 13 años que apareció, no le llegó, no le comió más remedio de que mi, mi hermano me abrió, pues. Me recuerdo que nos subimos por primera vez marihuana a los 14 años de edad y no, me pasé allá por los pasillos buscando. Y yo me le iba y me le, me le perdía y. Ya casi cumpliendo los 15, y bueno, ahí fue donde por primera vez este, maté a un hombre. Fue ahí fue donde empezó mi vida delictiva, me dio temor, me dio miedo, porque yo lo veía que me perseguía el muerto, lo veía hasta en la sopa, en la comida, en el cuarto, lo veía en el baño, lo veía en la calle, atrás mío, al lado mío. Yo lo sentía cuando me decía que no, que no lo matara. Fue un temor tan tremendo, pero después, bueno. Después ya a los 15, a los 16 años, ya, ya había matado, yo había matado el segundo. Y se me vino como una, o sea, como un joven, pues. Ya, después que tú matas el primero, después que matas el segundo, ya no, ya no es más fácil, pues. Trabajar normal como todos los días del mundo, fue muy cantesco y bueno, vamos a empezar mi labor en el final diario. Eh, yo conozco bueno, a Yadira de hace unos 25 años, estaba muy joven. Una muchacha con toda su, su conducta de joven de la época, de estar en la fiesta, el lonche. Fue una madre de, este, muy joven también. Este, cuando yo la conocí, estaba casada, pero era muy joven. Así que bueno, es que... Más 
está en mi vida que me lleve al Señor de poder o nueve años y fuera acá y porque hay mucha pobreza en mi casa, de subirme. Y muchas veces, claro, la mamá hoy en día, yo no se lo recuerdo mucho, ya está, pero eso ya está muy bien, ¿no? pero sí sé que ella cada vez que me ve, me ve con mucho dolor, o sea, tiene como mucho sentimiento de culpa. ¿Qué? De que está en su mayor. Prácticamente, si te pones a tu mamá, 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 hay tu oportunidad de ser yo como persona. Si no te puedo lanzarme la tapa y voy a me convertir en una delincuente. Y ahí está la Cuando quise estudiar con mi mamá, para que me dieran un cuaderno, siempre habría problemas en mi casa. No, era horroroso, era horroroso, de verdad. Entonces yo me iba y lavaba carro, si no botaba basura. Y siempre buscaba de ganarme pan, siempre. Pero bueno, tú sabes que me había una propiedad con todo. Yo vivía en Guaratán y empecé a ver cuartear, cuartear, cosas. Drogas, violaciones, eh, y como morirse mis pies por sobredosis. O sea, tengo marcado también de promoción. Todo que vi. Bueno, en realidad, no fue porque le faltó amor de padre ni de madre, sino porque él quiso, él agarró esa vida. Vendía drogas, usaba armas. O sea, un delincuente común. Y él lo que hizo fue agarrar esa mala vida porque quiso. O sea, le gustaba tener plata fácil. Y a los nueve años, mi hermano, que cometió un homicidio, en el mismo lugar, me ponía una nueve mil Y una vez vi un muerto de la madrugada en la calle, está de cerca por la muerte, esa niñez estaba muy de cerca relacionado con todo lo que fue el tema de la violencia y las armas. Cuando uno estaba en el barrio, que ves que un hermano se mata, que ves que otro cae preso por un homicidio, se ve expuesta mi niñez, pero ya a los 15 años quería vivir mi propia experiencia. Mi hermano en prisión me decía que no fuese allá. Y yo le dije que me dejara vivir mi propia experiencia porque ya había visto mucho. Año 92, cuando tengo 18, 19 años, mi hermano salió a la calle y caí yo en prisión en el año 93, 94. Esto fue diciembre, yo estoy en la casa de mi tranquilita y me llega la, la, la noticia de que mi hijo estaba preso en San Cristóbal. Me gustó y está preso y está preso y está preso y yo quería oye, yo creía las pistolas, si no se me había pistolas, pues se veían poca, los cuchillos, la broma, y ya todo el mundo a veces me veían a visitar y decía, yo estoy preso, me decía, yo soy yo. Entonces yo era el hombre, se me apretó y me abrazó y me dijo, ¿qué llora yo? ¿Qué te pasa? Y dice, ay, no, yo te una broma aquí, pero no, no se lo digas a nadie. A mí me pusieron, un oh, muchacho no tenía donde dormir, y se lo pusieron a ver, con la cabeza para abajo, y llegaron un muchachos de otro pabellón y, y, y le volaron la cabeza a un muchacho y durmiendo con el techo en la cara. Y yo no podía hacer nada, mami, porque estamos presos, estamos presos y las cárceles son así, mami. Yo no sabía que las cárceles eran tan malas, mami. Lo que recuerdo claro es la oscuridad y el mal olor de una cárcel. Los hombres desesperados en campos de concentración de seres humanos que en Venezuela se llamaron el cementerio de hombres vivos. Así mismo se llaman las cárceles de nuestro país. Un cementerio de hombres vivos. Lo primero que sentí fue miedo. Miedo de encontrarme con ese monstruo tan grande y que no sabía cuántos enemigos podía tener ahí. Y empiezo sobre ello. 
a comerte una arepa tiene que hacer una cola, entonces va a ser la cola de 80, ¿sí? que no te vas a desayunar, entonces tiene que buscar la fuerza para comer primero. Dije, bueno, de aquí para adelante, Dios, todo lo que venga a atacarme, es mi vida la de él, todos los días. Tenía que ver homicidio, excremento, droga. No me importaba si mato, si hiero. No me importaba nada porque ya sentía que estaba marcada, muerta. Yo me sentía ahí muerta. Yo como vi, y este se pasó y se cayó y bueno. El mundo arrancó por rey cuando venía saliendo así que el hombre veía que el hombre que estaba vivo, bueno, ahí donde yo la mano lo tenía asegurado ahí. Y empezaba a chuzarse en el piso. Y... Pero no me gustó, pues. O sea, lo que el amigo mío hizo de, de matarlo de esa manera, con un niño en los brazos. O sea, fue una broma tremenda. Y, y era la misma que a la prisión. Y yo decía, oh Dios mío, que es esta broma, que un monstruo aquí adentro. Es un monstruo de cemento. Un monstruo de cemento donde. Yo a veces paso por el puente de Carlos, me paro en el puente Carlos y, y yo lo vaya y, y yo me acuerdo de todo. Corea no está en el puente de Carlos, pero no son cosas que nunca se han olvidado. O sea, son cosas que ya están aún, yo no, por esto está marcado y nunca más nadie se me ha olvidado. Esperé, me dijeron, mira, yo llevo la libertad y bueno, no lo creía porque ya llevaba cinco años ahí en ese penal. Me acuerdo que estaba angustiado, ansioso, la libertad. Bueno, me estaba esperando mi esposa, ya me había casado en el modelo. Y bueno, mira, en el metro, mucho veía mucha gente, los edificios altos. Me decía, le preguntaba que dónde salía tanta gente, angustiado, sin célula, sin... es mucho nervio. Pero bueno, después que acepté a Jesucristo en el año 99, me fui a la iglesia, tres años empecé un cambio de vida y ahí empezó a tener otro liderazgo. Entonces ya era más respetado porque había sido malandro y estaba cambiando y eso me daba un poder para defender al más débil. Lo que a mí me es que yo he dicho que soy un empresario que sobreviví a un infierno. Los empresarios son basura para la sociedad. Cuando llegó a coche, que la gente me vio, arrancó a correr. Y eso me hirió mucho. Soy un, me sentí un gusano, me hicieron sentir eso. No tengo apoyo de familia. Mi apartamento está en cuatro paredes en blanco. No tengo donde cocinar, no tengo donde dormir. ¿Qué hago? Bueno, ahí comencé mi historia. Ya dirá. De aquí para adelante es un mundo nuevo, una vida distinta. Y demuestra a esa gente que aún sabiendo que tienes rechazo, tú le tienes que demostrar de que tú sí vas a cambiar. Yo cuando me casé con mi esposa, el rodeo, el rodeo en la casa el rodeo uno. Cuando yo lo conocí, lo conocí siendo un delincuente, estaba solicitado, consumía drogas, me maltrataba. Después, bueno, que salió, eh, trabajaba por las calles, hacía cualquier cosa, vendía películas, siempre hacía cualquier cosa sí, para, para mantener el hogar. Y le compré la nevera a mi esposa, le compré la cocina a mi esposa, compré una cama. Compré el televisor, compré el DVD. Ya me decía, cuando la gente se tomaba un poco de agua fría, me sentí muy alegre y muy contento. Y yo decía, vamos a seguir subiendo, vamos a seguir subiendo, vamos a seguir subiendo. Yo no me siento orgulloso, no me siento muy demente, pero bueno, lo importante es que por lo menos los dos crezcan y tengan una buena educación. Como dice uno, pues a veces. No es necesario uno de ser millonario o de tener riqueza para uno ser educado o para que los hijos no sean educados.
De pronto la película se detiene ante mí, siendo yo la única espectadora, y aparecía allí una imagen ya golpeada por los años, envejecida por el tiempo, pero recién infalible ante el sufrimiento. Ejemplo inequívoco de una vida dedicada a los que amo. Sin querer y sin darme cuenta, en el suelo, mientras observo la imagen, se me ocurren sendas lágrimas con las mejillas. Esa imagen es la de mi madre, único ser que ha sido consecuente hasta la saciedad. Continúo en mi sueño y quiero aferrarme a él, pues mientras sueño seré libre, porque mis pensamientos y mis sueños jamás tendrán cautiverio. Sí me dieron el derecho de cambiar. Yo salí y dije que yo tenía que crecer mayúscula como persona, que a pesar de todas las adversidades que la vida te presenta, si tú te derrumbas y no luchas por lo que tú quieres, estás perdido. Y aún con todo lo que yo he luchado, siento que me falta muchísimo, muchísimo que hacer. Solamente le pido a Dios que me alcance el tiempo para, para poder ver a mis hijos convertidos en unos profesionales, eso que yo sueño, que yo no fui, pero que ellos, a pesar de no tener un padre, yo soy mamá, papá, su amante, su amiga, su compañera, su hermana, su todo. Y que me tienen la plena confianza de que, bueno, si su mamá un día lo defraudó, hoy le vengo a una recompensa. Yo, yo vendiendo jugo, vendiendo empanadas, yogur, refresco, me sustentaba porque dormía también en la cárcel. Y así muchos compañeros que así no teníamos dinero, pero nos ayudábamos y no, no queríamos delinquir. Bastante trabajé de buhonero y con un trabajo a un lado y el dinero que ganaba ya lo sentía propio, ganado, sudado. Y así empezamos a trabajar en proyecto de los personas. Dijimos que no hacer una casa en en donde el que no quiere volver a su vida, el que quiere seguir siendo el único que se venga para ahí. Y nosotros le damos techo, comida, y es lo único que iba a trabajar y estudiar. Pero también quiero ir más allá, porque las personas que están insertadas, que la mayoría de las personas que han sido delincuentes nos ayuden a aplacar la delincuencia en nuestro país. Personas que fuimos delincuentes, a rescatar los delincuentes. Gracias a Dios que tengo un hijo que me ayuda, pobremente, pero me ayuda. Yo le pido mucho a Dios que siga echando para adelante, que no, que no se vaya para abajo, que eche para adelante, eche para arriba. Ay, Dios mío. Ay, Dios mío. Aquí la de mí salió siendo un delincuente, esto va. Y bueno, aquí está la de mí nuevamente, un hombre cantó. Sobre la realidad de vuelto mucho tiempo y te lo vendo como este comedor. Bueno, madre, no te vamos a decir que te tengo perdón por cuatro años. Ay, gracias. 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 El ser delincuente no lleva nada. Hoy en día me sorprende muchísimo que muchísimo, la, la mayoría de las cárceles a nivel nacional están llenas de jóvenes, jóvenes pudiendo sorprendiéndose ahí formándose el futuro de Venezuela, porque ese es nuestro futuro como tal. Oye, cuando tú cambias, te ganas. Imagínate cambiar y ayudar a otro. Yo vi en el piso y hoy en día puedo vivir en paz, en tranquilidad y, y no nada más la paz por lo que tienes, sino la paz por lo que eres y por lo que transmites.
Thank you, folks. I didn't see that in a while. It can, it can be a bummer. So let's just let's just jump uh, straight to sit. Before we turn on the lights, I figure let's just go ahead and uh, it's all right. Uh, just to segue into the conversation about the book, here's a quick 30 second teaser of uh, the book we're going to be talking about. Este no es un libro de cualquiera. Estas páginas son especiales. La poesía, mensajes y retratos cuentan la historia de un país como nunca antes se había hecho. Se me ocurrió de la mente un proyecto de Carlos Berta, Texas, de Cinco All right, folks, thank you. And we can turn on the lights and then, Fadi, if you want to come on over, come on up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. No, thank you, Carlos Faride. Well, I think we're pretty much highly emotional after watching this documentary. And I'd like to open a, a dialogue with both of you, Faride and Carlos, and also the audience. Uh, Carlos, I heard you talk before when we talk about this project as uh, the documentary as the genesis of what ended up being a book. How was that process? Why a book instead of a whole documentary about Yadira's work or Yadira's poetry? Um, <clears throat> I honestly thought it was going to be uh, quicker to do a book than a documentary. <laughs> uh, no, honestly, when I wanted to do a, I wanted to do a document, um, a project, not only about Yadira's life, but also about Yadira's work. And inherently, because she's a writer, the, the best medium I saw um, fit for this was a tangible object. So like to read her work, to be able to spend time with her texts. Um, so on that end, I knew from the very beginning I needed to work on a, on, a, on a book with her. And on my end, the photography that's on this book, um, photography has always been a first lot for me, my passion. Uh, and I wanted to keep it simple as well. Images that you could look into as a way of a photo essay, the narrative. So um, that alone uh, made me think, yeah, let's make it into a book. But Actually, and, and Farid, you might, you might talk about this later on, but I, I did use some conventions from the documentary work that I do uh, onto this book. So the book is actually um, put together as a narrative documentary would. It has a cold open. It has a very set act one, act two, act three. And at the very end, uh, you can open a flap and that's your behind the scenes, so to speak, or the epilogue, really. So I did use some of these conventions that I would use on a, traditional documentary onto this one, if that answers that. that answer. Yeah, absolutely. So my next question will be to you, Faride. Uh, what did you think the first time you heard about this project, and especially knowing that Carlos has been working on the project for so many years? My first approach was that I was very interested because anything that has to do with my country is something that I'm uh, deeply drawn towards. And I have had conversations with Carla in the past because of Elena Figuera, a curator and uh, artist, photographer, teacher. Right. Um, she had made comments about how certain parts of Carla's work had a dialogue with what I was doing. So it just made sense given the, the previous comments and the subject of the book okay. um, that we met to discuss the possibility of it. Um, when we met, I saw the quality of the photographs and I saw the documentary and I felt, and I know, I know that it's not the same and I know it's not at all the same circumstances, but I felt really connected to the Jalida story because she says that poetry and literature saved her life and mm -hmm. made a uh, prison bearable for her. And in my end, uh, with other kinds of problems, I feel books saved my life. So I was not only connected 
or in dialogue with Carlos photography, but also with gender aspects. So just in a personal way. Yeah, and I think from the from the beginning when we sat down, uh, I think the first thing we did was watch this documentary. Oh, actually, the first no? thing we <laughs> where's the book? Oh yeah. The first thing that Carlos wrote to me was this book. Uh, that he made himself um, just like a print on demand book. And I was just so um, surprised is not the word, so impressed mm -hmm. because this. Muchos aquí hablan español, ¿verdad? I think so. Se voy a hablar entre español e inglés porque hay cosas que no me salen en inglés. Siento que ver este tomo me demostraba además este, como, como una minucia o un, un, una especie de carácter obsesivo con respecto a los contenidos eh, como dentro de los recursos que él manejaba que eran audiovisuales eh, tratar de representarlos en, en printed book ¿no? y él tenía como ciertos ensayos o aproximaciones a, a esa serie de fotografías y esos textos en formato de libro y eso fue una de las cosas que también llamó mi atención ¿no? como um, yeah, uh, and, and just to, and maybe we'll talk about this later, but there was a huge process. So you just saw like the, the background, the context of who Javira Silva is from a very, very small scope. Over here, this documentary was just about the prison system in Venezuela. Though as a person, though as a writer, it's another thing, which is why we decided to do this. But yeah, she basically, funny, this is that I'm very obsessive. We actually got nine books that Yavira had uh, abandoned in an apartment in Caracas. And what I did was, we digitized them and transcribed them, and I put them in this little booklet over here. It's unedited. This is her entire work over here. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, uh, and then we went through versions. This was the first version, just the text and some photos. And then, you know, after the event, you guys can see what the other second and third iterations looked like before we got to this. But anyways, we're jumping all over the place. Excellent, <laughs> excellent. About the book's name, it oh, yeah. suddenly occurred to me that sudden, that sounds so immediate so right now and it took many years to achieve the book right. so i was living it through this whole process of making the book for so many years well if you don't if you don't mind yeah like the name it suddenly occurred to me in english in spanish and yeah. basically just to start from there it alludes to how javira writes she writes in a very stream of consciousness approach immediately she does this beautiful thing you get to read in the book where she is writing to this third person, you don't know who, who they are. And then she says, like she marks an ellipsis, dot, dot, dot. Hold on, there's something going on out there. I'm gonna go check it out. And then the next line is, yes, yeah, something is happening, but I'm gonna keep writing just to say it. It's like she's talking to someone on the phone, which I thought it was fantastic. She wrote everything. Um, with my photography, the, the, the title still works conceptually because um, the, the photos over here were taking evidently just stills. One snap, and that's the moment that I capture it. I'm not the kind of photographer who just snaps 10,000 photos per scene. And in fact, all the photographs here are 35 millimeter black and white film. So at that point, at that time, it was cheaper for me uh, to buy film than to have a digital camera. So I was very selective with it. Uh, so the title works there in, in that sense. When it comes to the process, it took forever. Yadira and I worked from 2010 to 2014 because we knew, you know, on and off while I was at work and she was at work, we worked on this. And in 2014, Back then, the vice president of Venezuela called my name out on national television. By then, I had been reporting on corruption and political turmoil. So he named me along with seven or other uh, uh, journalists. And then I had to prioritize my time. Then I had to say, OK, well, I'm going to have to stop that for a minute. And then I worked on something else until 2018, when I ran into a photograph that I had taken to this book, Connected with Yadira. But I was lucky that Farida was here in New York. I was living in New York. She designed the book. By 2020, we sent the book to a printer in Caracas. Pandemic hit. And then also Venezuela, you know, the economy, the, the materials that weren't available. So it took two years, basically, to produce, two extra years to produce 200 copies of this little work of art. And they were finally shipped and got here I to New York. There's also a beauty in that mm -hmm. because it's, it was a conscious choice to print in Venezuela. Right. Um, and it's not the same to print or develop a book like this, let's say printing in China or printing in the US yeah. as it is going through the entire process. Mm -hmm. 
in the country where the photographs were shot in yeah. the city where these things happen. And another really important aspect is that this specific printing press where I used to work, Ex Lewis. Mm -hmm. um, I worked there for for several years, and I still keep in touch with them. It's actually closing right now, fortunately. Um, these happened to be one of the last books printed there. So to me, it also meant the close uh, closure, not only for the the over a decade project that Carlos Carlos had been working with Darida, but the end of also an important part of book history in the country per se. Yeah, it was like a farewell. So, yeah, I, I, you said before that you felt connected to the to the book the first time you heard about it. Uh, in terms of your work, uh, how does the book is related, like conceptually, with Yadira's poetry? Uh, well, from from a aesthetic perspective, I would say I try to keep a lot of the integrity, not only of the format of the images, the scale of the images, but um, facsimile of the manuscripts. I wanted people to feel the way we work the book. Mm -hmm. uh, the texts were edited in a way that we wanted to keep that sense of urgency mm -hmm. in her text. Mm -hmm. So we didn't over polish them or make them too precious. The, the texts are very, uh, very clear, but at the same time, we kept that roughness from the original text. There's no, you don't want to do, you know, um, you don't gotta want to get in the way of what she wanted. Yeah, right? you know, there's no Oxford manual for you know, <laughs> yeah, fast writing in prison. Mm -hmm. So uh, that also came in hand with uh, the sequencing of the images, preserving the manuscripts, and there's even a section of the book that's uh, very intimate. So there's certain letters, the only love letters in the book, and we made them go inside of the French fold. So mm -hmm. if you have seen the book. All the binding is French fold, which means that each page is double. So it's only printed on one side and it's bound in a way where you can see both sides on the page folded. So when you arrive in the middle of the book, as Carla was saying, we thought we conceptualized the book in a way that was um, like a documentary. Right. So when you arrive to this part, the love letters begin. And then here you start to see frames from the documentary. And then when you reach this part, you have the letters hiding inside. So the only way to, to be able to read uh, those is to tear open the book. Right. So you're also- uh, Interacting right, with the book. Yeah, yeah, and you're setting her words free some way. Uh, all these, um, uh, frames are from the documentary and parts of the prison. Yeah, one thing that I think if you if you allow me, Faride, that was brilliant, is that from the get-go, Faride was very adamant about incorporating part of the documentary into the storytelling in the book. So yeah, she's saying in Act 2, and I've always referred to, you know, Act 1, Act 2, Act 3 in, in the book, then you literally have to rip pages open to free up these texts. So conceptually, that answers your question is, like graphically, conceptually, yeah, there is that um, that notion of we're freeing a text, just as Farida, uh, just as Yalida had to uh, once she came out of you know those years in in prison, just kind of cope with the idea that well, she was a free woman in a society that was still very you know discriminating against her, mm -hmm. but she wasn't going to let that get in the way of her writing in a, yeah. in, in a sense. Also, uh, if I don't want to give away all the graphic brilliance of Farida in, in the book. But Yadira, she wrote from in, from prison with no light in complete darkness. So act one, for example, graphically speaking, you have white text over dark background. And you'll see that some of the lines where the texts are uh, tilted, you know, uh, or diagonal, just as she would move her book, you know, left or right, just to write. Uh, so graphically speaking, uh, it seems chaotic, but there's an order to it. Oh, like in real time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah like if she was. You know, my work also know that I'm very inspired by concrete poetry, which is part of the Latin American tradition in typesetting. So, right.
right? And in Act Three, on the other hand, you would have then uh, clean. The Act One is more dark, the more talking about the past. Act Two are these letters from prison. Act Three are the more are the text looking for redemption. Uh, text more mature, where she talks about this is what I learned, and this is what I want today, this is what I hope for. So those texts are more organized, more structured, traditional black ink over white paper. And uh, the yeah. photographs are fully bled onto the edge. So even if you put the clothes from the forage, you see the progression where you have the block of the printed image, and then the second act, if you have to tear open, and the first part, which is printed. But it did take a lot of work graphically and so that visually you'll be able to tell where's act one, act two, act three, where to work. And in fact, that's the cold open that I talk about as again, as a movie or as a series of one that would start, uh, we drop right into the action of the book with a letter she wrote from prison, but you don't open the book traditionally in you know, Western civilization from, left, from right to left, you open it from the centerfold open and you get into the action of it, you see the index and then, then you start the book from the beginning. So, anyways, much more to talk about graphically speaking. Yeah, I like a lot how the book plays with the with the dark, with the dark, because yeah, they wrote in the dark in prison, <laughs> right. right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, and uh, about your relationship with with Yadira, you've known Yadira for so many years. Right. You have a professional relationship, of course, but also a very close right. relationship. So, I think we all can ask the same. Like, what's your favorite poem, yeah. idea, quote yeah. of Yadira's work? I'm not going to give the cliche answer out oh, too many. I love them all. I mean, she does have, I, I, to this day, when I sit down and I read her, like the book, there's, there's just some new things. It's just, it's just amazing. Obviously, the documentary does not do her justice when it comes to her writing. There's a lot to be learned from who she is from these texts over here. Uh, if I had to pick one, it would be a simple one. Is the one that actually inspired me to get to work with her some 10, 11 years ago. It, it appears on the title page. If you don't mind, I'll read it real quick. It's two lines. Uh, it reads, I thought that in order to write, you had to be a professional. I've realized that even from their aftermost place in the alphabet, my consonants can dare to reach for the respectable vowels leading over in the front lines. So for, from those two lines, I understand that she realizes that she needs permission from nobody to be able to write, even though she doesn't have proper education, even though you know, she's, she has you know, misspellings or mm -hmm. grammatical errors. She needs no one's permission to do what she loves, and she continues to write very confidently, which at the time that I began working on this, I didn't know anything about bookmaking. I didn't know anything about book design. I hadn't met. I still had to wait 10 years to meet Farida, but I still felt she can write. I can take photos. We can dream up this book whenever and however it comes to life. So that very much inspired me. That two lines. Of her. Yeah, the book itself is also a poem. And I wanted to ask you about the whole printing process, but you already so something yeah. really rare nowadays is to make a book in offset. Um, as you know, with prints like demand and small print runs, uh, it's more common to have digital offset or digital printing being riso or whatever it is. But we wanted to keep uh, the book going hand or tied to the tradition of bookmaking in Venezuela, and that meant um, offset. And also, it also allows us to do things that we normally wouldn't do with other techniques as the French fold in this specific size. Um, if we were to make, for example, a smaller book or a portrait book, um, portrait not portrait photography, but the format, uh, maybe the type of folding would have been able to be achieved in, with digital printing or more common machines. Mm -hmm. But the fact that he wanted the book landscape like a movie, like, um, the frame, yeah. yeah, like the frame, um, also presented itself as a challenge to me and how we were going to produce it. Uh, the book is hand bound, and each book is bound in a press, uh, with cold glue and a brush. Um, all the um, spines are folded with a bone folder. This is calico iris, uh, German cloth. The spine is also printed offset. And then the cover was then laminated. So the inside of the book is made with three type, two types of paper. And we have also an insert in vellum. Right. Um, we have just 
regular uh, Susana paper, which is a paper from Brazil. And then we have, um, forgetting. <laughs> so many. <laughs> I, I do have to say that I learned so much from Farida. Like to you, to you folks who are not like acquainted with the printing process, some of these things I had to learn, some of these things I still don't know to this day. What I wanted to do was to trust Farida that she would put together this physically and beautifully and she understood exactly what we wanted to do from the beginning. So much that when we got the book made uh, and it got shipped over here, I talked to Farida and I said, I think like if, 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 like if it's missing something, right? I want, and she was great to suggest, uh, uh, I don't know if you want to talk about the, what I figure would be like the, the last you know, little thing that the, that the book needed, which was this book sleeve that has some black foil over here and it's just beautiful. And I think also here. one of the things we saw in the documentary, Sorry. we saw in the documentary, it only got to see Yadira's story, story until one point. But then with this book, we get to see further because it's not only the type that he wrote in prison, but also what happened to her after in her collaboration from Carlin in over a decade. Um, and we also get to see, get to see more. It's a, it's a yeah. more, uh, it's a deeper and extensive. Uh, you dived into. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and it's also very yeah. different to watch a documentary or see, or see a, a photography show in a museum or in a gallery and the experience you get one-on-one -on -one with a book. It's a very intimate experience. So I think also in material materiality, the book expresses that from the fact that this was printed in Venezuela and shipped to the fact that we finished it or wrapped it in the U.S. <laughs> yeah. To your note on the context of it, you're absolutely right. Uh, in fact, um, it's hard to sometimes to talk about Yadira by just showing that documentary because it, it, it seems to come with a lot of um, judgment, right? Like, why did she go to prison is the first thing or the first thing that people ask me when I started to talk about it. Um, and in the documentary, we, we mentioned it a bit. She's much more than that. She went to prison when she was 20 years old or so, right? Uh, by the time she was 28, she left prison. She's, she's six, uh, almost 60 now. And she, uh, she spent a lifetime trying to redeem herself, trying to do everything for her kids, learning from her mistakes, becoming someone else. She wanted to be here today. Obviously, she's in Mexico uh, these days. Uh, in next talks and chats, I want her to be able to participate, to share a little bit about her story. Um, because also the book yeah. travels for her. Exactly. I think so. And I think that when you read just the first page, it gives you a sense of who she is and what the rest of the book is it's going to be like. Yeah. I would like to ask you both something in these times full of instagram reels images here images there how do you see this book in 10 years from now 10 years from now. <laughs> um well i think i don't know if this is exactly what we're talking about but um i think it's a bit of, of a cliche to talk about how images are you know saturated or everywhere or whatnot i i think the beauty of a photo book since we're talking about photo books is the fact that uh, it's something tangible. It's something that allows you to be present, right? Um, we used to like mock and call hipsters, like I don't know, 10 years ago. I don't think anybody calls hipsters anybody. Those people who buy, buy vinyl records, for example. I still have vinyl records and my wife hates how much money I spend on vinyl records. But it's because it, it allows me to sit down with music, to sit down and literally listen for 10 to 20 minutes something, and not just have it in the background. I feel like looking at this, for example, this book or any book digitally, it's just, uh, you know, sweeping through. But to be able to, what you were talking about. The physicality. To, yeah, yeah. The, be able to grab it, to see the photographs, to get closer, to read and reread the text. Just holding it, I know that I'm going to spend at least an hour going through this book. Little by little. So I think that's the beauty of it. And I hope that in 10 years, the story still stands and you can still appreciate this, what I would hope is a timeless story. Um, yeah, like a classic. Yeah, yeah I don't know. Timeless. Like timeless. I, I feel that the book is an important reference document, not only for its literary uh, value or photographic value, but also as a testimony of a specific time period in Venezuela, specific time period in the U.S., which is you know, what we've been through with uh, shipping the book because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Right. And also... Um, the end of a very important um, 
process, which was you know since eighty four ex lyrics the, the press that printed this book, which is the press that printed the most important books for more the libro más insignia del país, como son las enciclopedias de polar, los libros de geografía, los libros de geohistoria, los libros con los que estudiamos. Con los que estudiamos. Entonces esa esa tradición editorial que existe en el país para mí que vaya de la mano con la experiencia de una mujer como Yadira y las fotografías de alguien tan talentoso como Carlos, eh, que haya sido además producido con tanta intención, intencionalidad, intencionalidad ya se me olvidan las palabras, mm -hmm. intencionalidad y que hayamos decidido, bueno, que Carlos haya confiado en mí para el primer libro en Venezuela, para mí significa mucho. Me parece que como libro es una referencia muy importante que hay que tener. Eh, y un legado también, ¿no? Este, este final de la de Ex Libris. Sí, bueno, Ex Libris continuará de muchas otras maneras. Okay. Este... okay. Yeah, the press. It was such an important, that like, you're talking about the printing press, and it's, it was, first of all, it was an honor first that uh, Javier um, was able to keep us, you know, to have us there, to print this book over there, so that, that we were very lucky to be able to do that in Venezuela. Uh, I know that we just have a few minutes uh, left. Um, I wanted to say before, I don't know if you have another question or not. But, not really. <laughs> but, not really. Uh, but sorry. I wanted I just, to ask you both the, the yeah. last question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I do want to say that um, I talked to Fari, uh, to Yadira, sorry, I keep saying Farid and Yadira. Uh, I talked to Yadira Silva a while back, right? And when we were talking about what to do with the work, how it was going to come out, and her and I both agreed that we wanted the book to have uh, uh, a practical impact. So we're, we're proud to say, though, that all the sales from this book are going to Humanitarian Action Org, at least a section, a very big, $10,000 uh, from the sales of the book is what we've pledged to Humanitarian Action Org, which is a nonprofit based in Washington that's helping refugees both in the U.S. and uh, elsewhere. Um, so that, that meant a lot both to Yadira and, and I. And of course, Yadira is just static that her work is being read in Spanish and in English these days, because she never thought that she was ever going to be out there for people to, uh, to see. And, and lastly, this is a tangible object. We're working on a very robust uh, website that has all the videos, making offs, interviews, if you're ever you know, interested in that. But if you purchase a book, it comes with little uh, cute cards and QR codes that you can just scan. It'll take you to the documentary and the website and so on and so forth. That's the spiel, sorry. Very marketing. <laughs> I ask you for a big applause. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that, thank you, Karine, for being here. And thank you for you folks being here. Uh, the event closes at eight. So spend the next 15 minutes. Please drink the wine. There's some <laughs> left. And also come and talk to us one-on-one -on -one if you have any questions about the book, and especially if you want to support the project and the nonprofit. If you want to purchase a book, Uh, my my wife is there, Rachel White, and I'm going to be there as well. If you want to know about more about the book and purchase one, we, we, we can do the right at that table there. Yeah. Uh, base um, contribution for the book is 125. Anybody's obviously open to donating whatever they want for the book. Uh, if you uh, donate $300 or more, you get a signed uh, and numbered copy of a photograph, one of the photographs. I think, I don't know if you can see them over, over here, but we have uh, dark room photographs printed in uh, Juana's dark room in Brooklyn. Uh, and those are obviously photographs taken for the book back in, from 2009, 2014. So thank you so much, folks. All right, drink one, drink one. Thank you guys very much. <laughs> Milena hoy, pero es Milena, para entender el mensaje, de verdad, porque yo y de me di cuenta con ellos, la mocha, no lo pudimos poner. Uh, ella me envió una presentación, es imposible leerla. Pero se la falta, pero la falta. No, no, no se preocupe. ¿Qué tal? Entonces, ¿Qué ¿Qué tal? ¿Qué tal? ¿Qué tal? ¿Qué tal? Ah, no, yo pensaba. Aquí se me Congratulations. Thanks, man. Rachel is somewhere over there. Oh, yeah, yeah. oh my God.